In this video, I'm going to kind of be discussing a little bit about how to communicate with an anti-gunner or a person who doesn't understand the Second Amendment. In order to do that, it's a process that people need to understand uh, our history, time, and place. Uh, they need to understand concepts. They need to understand why this was developed in the first place and the building of our great country. So let's go ahead and get into it. So when discussing the Second Amendment, people need to understand the context of the times that we were in. Everybody knows 1776, uh, Declaration of Independence. Not too many people know about what happened in the next year, 17. 77 or what happened in 1789 and 1791 so let's have a discussion on those but first let's go ahead and go over the actual second amendment itself which James Madison wrote as part of the ten, first ten amendments to the Constitution in 1791 far after the Declaration of Independence and far after the ratification of the Constitution in 1789. All right, the Second Amendment, most beautiful words I ever heard. Here it is, the Second Amendment to the United States Constitution, December 1791, authored by James Madison. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, when you're discussing that with somebody, they've heard all different kinds of interpretations. But back to the time and place. Back in the 1780s or whatever, the colloquial English was spoken in a different way. And when laws were developed, they started out with what was called uh, two different clauses. The first part was a justification clause, and the second part was the operative clause. So the justification clause is this first sentence, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. Justification. Now the operative clause, the right of the people. To keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Can't be any clearer than that. As a matter of fact, it is the shortest of all of the amendments in our Constitution because it is quite specific. But let's go over a little bit more about the time and place. Remember those dates that I gave you. 1776, First Continental Congress got together. Uh, they... 13 colonies that were actually foreign countries to each other. Each of them had their own economy, each of them had their own uh, background of where they came from, whether they were agrarian uh, or, or mill workers or whatever, but mostly they were all immigrants. These 13 colonies stood themselves and stood their own ground and did not want to be governed by a central authority uh, appointed uh, by, uh, by a colony that they necessarily didn't agree with or get along with. All right, so let's move on a little bit uh, further without getting deeper into that. A well-regulated militia. Well, at the time, these 13 colonies were made up of boroughs or small towns, uh, etc. And these people would have regular meetings of getting together on how to protect their community from outside sources, whether it would be uh, an indigenous uh, population uh, or robbers, thieves, or in some cases that aristocracy who had sort of their own police force, their own army that worked in the aristocracy's interest. So they developed, as you remember, uh, what was called the Minutemen. The Minutemen were uh, men of age over 14 uh, that had their own rifles, their own ammunition, etc. That on a moment's notice when the bell, church bell rang or if there was a rider who got on a horse, everybody remembers the famous ride of Paul Revere uh, that would go around to these farms and houses and they would practice and train and to locate 
and practice together and form a unit to, uh, to get rid of their oppressors uh, by force. So fast forward now to the Declaration of Independence and what transpired thereafter. Everybody knows about Concord and Lexington. These were two townships that were definitely against the crown and against uh, uh, the usurper force of the Redcoats that were coming in and taking over their lodging and their houses and their commerce and all that kind of stuff. Well, they decided to go ahead and use their militia, which was common man, put together for a common purpose, trained for a common purpose to be able to uh, turn back the British. That is what really started the Revolutionary War. Those two battles. And you can read about it, just go to Wikipedia or anything else and read about those short battles and those brave men who sacrificed all. And that's the key point here. What are you willing to sacrifice for your own freedom? In that date and time, they sacrificed everything. Their lives, their prosperity, their families. Their, their honor, their faith, everything. Put that into context with today where we don't necessarily put the same emphasis as they put back then. Okay, so now let's go into 1777. These 13 colonies actually got together and formed the actual first constitution of the United States called the Articles of Confederation. Now, these Articles of Confederation were limited in the scope, they did not want to have a central authority. They wanted to be able to, all 13 colonies, to be able to develop their own militias, protect their own lands, and in occasion help out a neighbor. So that was the first constitution. And believe you me, South Carolina had nothing in common with New York. Uh, or New England even had nothing in common with South Carolina. And they quite frankly, didn't understand or even like each other. But the Articles of Confederation bound them together against a common foe, and that was the King of England. Okay, now let's talk about the actual firearms itself. Uh, you can't fight an organized army with pitchforks, shovels, and uh, just yelling and screaming. So at the time, there was not a lot of millineries out that were building rifles that was not controlled by the British. So a lot of people uh, got together and, and started to make their own barrels, their own type of rifles, and there was no commonality of caliber even. So that's where that qualifying clause comes in. The right of people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Well, these militias had to be able to share ammunition, to share powder, to share firearms. So that's where the hierarchy of the militia started to come in to say, all right, we all, we all are going to be shooting the same caliber, the same powder, uh, the same type of rifle. Therefore, if somebody goes down in battle, the next person can pick up your firearm, your powder, and use it. Uh, so a commonality of the actual firearm is where the hierarchy of the militia, the word militia, started. So militia is, is often misused. It is an organization loosely affiliated of, of the willing. Uh, so how did they choose their hierarchy and how did they choose their organization? Well, if you recall, before, way before 1776, all of these colonies had been at various wars. Uh, most uh, recently was the French and Indian War. So there were American patriots, such as George Washington, who had actual battle experience and could actually understand how the military on the British side worked. So they needed to organize and train cohesiveness to be able to stand up against this greater force. So that they chose their leaders by experience. So I want to make it clear that militia was not centrally located. It was organized at the town, the borough, or even the city level by willing volunteers. That's individuals. 
after the war of independence was finally won and secured, the Second Continental Congress got together and decided that we needed to form from an Articles of Confederation to an actual constitution that all 13 colonies would agree to. They never really believed in federalism or a central authority. They believed that each state or each one of the provinces had their own ability to retain their own rights, but collectively against a foreign uh, entity like England or some other country that they would cohesively come together. It took until 1789 to have a piece of paper that we now know as the United States Constitution for all 13 colonies to agree to. So today we have 50 states and some people may argue well we've got organized police departments We've got an organized military, uh, so, you know, people don't need to have individual uh, firearms uh, of any type of persuasion, etc., to protect themselves. They could not be more wrong. From 1791 until today, believe it or not, the very first not the, not the second civil war that everyone knows about, but the very first civil war happened less than three years after we were organized as a country. It was called the Whiskey Rebellion. It had to do with western Pennsylvania and a federal tax that was imposed upon whiskey. Obviously this created a tremendous amount of outrage because transportation in those days involving wheat and rye and the types of things that, that make whiskey, transportation was near impossible to get it to a place that was a distillery or whatever to be bottled and made. So a lot of these farmers distilled and made it right there on their own land because they could transfer those bottles much easily easier or kegs or whatever container much easier than they could the raw material. The federal government stepped in and decided to do a whiskey tax. That was a rebellion that lasted two years. George Washington, uh, president at the time, decided to put together a professional militia from a conference uh, from four states, Virginia, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Maryland and put together a 12,000 man force to put down the Whiskey Rebellion of maybe 600 uh, organized men. So obviously it didn't last very long. So you can see that the federal government today can outnumber or overwhelm a, an organized rebellion that may be legitimate and guaranteed by the Constitution by the way. Okay, enough of the history, so let's talk about the actual associations of people that are firearms enthusiasts today and how they all need to work together and not be segregated by whatever type of firearms entertainment or enjoyment they have. Believe it or not, hunters are actually training all the time. They're training uh, for spot and stock or for ambush uh, type of uh, of tactics. These are military tactics, although loosely configured to the, indi the individual hunter and how he wants to use it. Then there's the actual competitor. The, ac the actual competitor that goes to these organizations because they like to shoot firearms and they're naturally competitive and they want to be able to uh, to take their firearm and their ammunition against like-minded people and do the best that they can for awards or celebration or even for commerce. Then, the, then there is the firearms industry itself. Uh, they need to actually work together to, for a common goal. That common goal that ties us all together is the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution Bill of Rights that guarantees you are a country to yourself. You are free. You have the ability to maintain your liberty and your posterity for yourselves and for your family forever. 
Well, folks, I didn't, uh, this was actually a presentation that I made years ago to a bunch of high school seniors who had no idea of what, how, the importance of the Second Amendment. So this brief video, I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, uh, don't forget to ask in the comment section. But leave me a thumbs up, if you will. Don't forget to subscribe. And I'll see you next time when we'll actually be doing some shooting. Uh, thanks for watching, folks. I appreciate it. Have a good day. Goodbye.